Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Amber Nightingale Sultani, the Associate State Director for Community Outreach with AARP here in Northern Virginia. And I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. AARP Virginia is thrilled to continue our collaboration with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University. This collaboration allows us an opportunity to bring our members a sampling of the rich programs that is offered each semester by Ali Mason. From our earliest beginnings, AARP has been a champion of lifelong learning. Our founder, Dr. Ethel Percy Andrews, once said, the eagerness to learn, to pioneer in the development of new skills and new abilities, to broaden the personal scopes of understanding, to freshen the mind with new ideas and new concepts, to achieve new heights of knowledge has no age restriction. Those words are as true today as when she spoke them in the 1950s. Studies have shown that challenging your brain in new ways throughout your life may strengthen your brain. Our brain is stimulated and makes new connections when we learn new things or pursue new interests. So AARP encourages you to stay curious and give yourself a good mental workout by doing something that challenges your thinking, offers you enjoyment, and encourages you to grapple with new and complex ideas. And I hope today's lecture will do that for you and more. Thank you again for joining us. Greetings and warm welcome from Ollie Mason. The Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at George Mason University has been in existence for over 30 years. We offer lectures, clubs, special events, and trips, as well as many volunteer opportunities such as teaching and service on committees. There are many things you can learn and do at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. We're very happy to be collaborating today with AARP and I want to welcome all of our OLLI members as well as those of you who are coming in from Virginia and across the United States. We're very happy that you've joined us today and we hope that you will look at our website to learn more about OLLI at OLLI, O-L-L-I dot G-M-U dot E-D-U. Please enjoy today's presentation. I hope you find this topic as interesting as I have in, in putting it together. Uh, we're going to ponder the question this morning. First of all, let me say we're going to talk this morning about the Metropolitan Museum of Art. <clears throat> we'll talk about the National Gallery next week and uh, some of the, the various and sundry museums after that, all American. We're going to ponder the question of where museums come from. The answer actually, by and large, is different for uh, museums in Europe than it is uh, for museums in, the, in this country. In Europe, museums, at least the largest of them, uh, tend to be in palaces. And that's, of course, because they were once royal collections. Uh, America, with, of course, its distinct lack of royalty, uh, museums had to evolve differently. The original idea of a public museum uh, to, to allow anyone to view cultural and artistic tre treasures actually probably dates back to uh, the 1470s when Pope Sixtus IV, who built the Sistine Chapel, uh, also uh, opened up the Capitoline Museum to all of the citizens of Rome. 35 years later, his nephew, Pope Julius II in 1506, opened his collection of classical sculpture in an open garden uh, next to the uh, Vatican. Michelangelo studied statues there. The Louvre opened to Parisians uh, when Napoleon not only threw the doors open, but filled it with, to the brim really, with art that he had uh, looted from across Europe and Egypt, uh, much of which, at least the European part, had to be returned after the Battle of Waterloo. For a few years, however, uh, that was by far the largest art collection the world had ever seen. And uh, the Paris public could actually freely enjoy all the treasures at least once uh, one day a week. That was the, really the beginning of the notion that art was something to be enjoyed, not merely by the rich who commissioned it, but collected and uh, made available to all citizens, rich or poor. So the museums of Europe, by and large, were founded upon 
centuries of royal patronage and military plunder. In the US, however, uh, since we lacked an aristocracy, uh, the idea of a public space for art did not really take root until the 1870s in the period christened unforgettably by Mark Twain, the Gilded Age, not yet noted golden, but gilded. That era was unique in all sorts of ways. The, the nation was rapidly expanding thanks to the new technology of the railroads, uh, opening up vast territories in the West. Innovations in oil drilling and steel manufacturing led to the amassing of honestly staggering fortunes never before achieved by, by men, at least a half a dozen of whom actually would found public art museums, as we will see over the next few weeks. This was an age of purist materialism, of unfettered capitalism, of the so-called robber barons, of nascent uh, unions and, and great labor unrest, and also of massive levels of corruption of the government in most cities. Um, and this was also no, very notably the era of massive immigration into those cities by successive waves from Ireland, from Germany, from Italy, and finally from Eastern Europe, each jostling to survive and replace their uh, predecessors. The result was extreme urban crowding and rampant violent crime suffered by everybody except those who could afford to insulate themselves from it. And into the midst of this, in that era, the idea of the public museum first emerged in the US, in some measure really as a means to expose the underclasses to the civilizing power of culture and art, and as a means of gentling them, I guess, by uplifting them with visions of great art. So the year 1870 in particular was a, a, a significant turning point because major museums in the East Coast, uh, three in three of its largest cities actually, all were started in that year. Uh, the MFA in Boston, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. Uh, the Metropolitan, which is our subject today. Notice they both have very classical facades. Uh, and the third was in Washington, D.C. And uh, no, of course, that's not the National Gallery. It's the Corcoran Gallery, which was founded also, actually uh, uh, chartered and opened in 1870. We'll talk about uh, all of these uh, museums. But interestingly, there was one difference between the Met and the other two galleries in, the, in this regard. Um, the Met had no building and no paintings when it opened, uh, not true of the other two museums. So basically it had nothing but the name when it was chartered in 1870. At that moment in New York, uh, well, New York City didn't exist then. That didn't happen until 1897. Uh, the Brooklyn Bridge connecting the two separate cities of Brooklyn and Manhattan uh, would begin the construction in that year of 1870, it wouldn't open until 1883. Um, 1870, as I mentioned, was the era of the robber barons, uh, Jay Gould, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt and railroads. And I mentioned uh, corruption was rampant, even up to the vice president of the U.S. taking uh, uh, stock, being given stock in the credit mo uh, mobilier scandal, uh, Union Pacific Railroad stock. Everybody was on the take. No city in the U.S. more exemplified the worst of this post-war cor corruption than New York. Uh, New York had an absolutely appalling uh, poverty rate. Uh, there were an estimated 10,000 homeless children prowling the streets of New York. So if you think it's bad today, it was much worse then. There was no safety net. Uh, inhuman levels of crowding in the tenements, tenements uh, filth, inescapable poverty, and all of it was presided over by this gentleman. Uh, I'm sure you know him, uh, Boss Tweed. New York in that 18, year of 1870 was entirely under the thumb of uh, Tweed. He, he was at the peak of his power. Uh, nearly half of the residents of New York at the time were foreign born and Tweet exploited that uh, fabulously to play off groups against each other and, and uh, attain political power that way. Uh, the trustees of the emerging American 
Museum of Natural History and the Met Metropolitan, get, and, and some of which were on both boards, by the way, that those trustees had gathered together signatures of prominent people from New York and also 40,000 just ordinary citizens. And uh, they were carried to Boss Tweed uh, by a man by the name of Joseph Schott. Um, by the way, Tweed hated Thomas Nass. He didn't mind being vilified in the press, but his uh, constituents who could not read uh, could this Thomas Nass cartoon did him far more damage than any uh, article that was written about him. So Joseph Choate on the, the um, both boards of directors in 1870 took this petition for a new art museum and a science museum to Tweed. Much to their surprise, both board members, uh, the uh, Tweed dec decided to approve it at once, only suggesting that the $500,000 they were asking for for a new building actually be $6 million. <laughs> and uh, it's it's really no mystery why Treed suddenly embraced public culture. He had just built a new county courthouse, which had cost him uh, $3 million to build, but for which the city paid $12 million, uh, with T. Tweed and his uh, cronies picking up the difference. Uh, just for perspective, $12 million is twice the price that the U.S. paid for Alaska in the same year that the courthouse was built. Some people have estimated that Tweed altogether swindled taxpayers out of $100 million. And uh, <laughs> that's, uh, again, fantastic levels. Tweed actually was about to go down, but he didn't know that yet in 1870. On this delicate matter of the ownership, who would own the museums? Uh, Choate proposed a really rather crucial compromise. The city would own the land and buildings and maintain the buildings and the trustees would own the art. So the city would pay an ongoing fee to maintain, maintain the buildings uh, and uh, the trustees would add to the collection. That was an experiment that had never been tried before, but it worked successfully. And it's actually the model in the majority of museums that emerged in the decades following this. And today also the government typically owns the land or furnishes uh, the land and the building, but is uninvolved in the art uh, collection itself. That is different though than the MFA and the Corcoran uh, which neither solicited government funds nor received any. They were totally private, and thus they had full control. Uh, the law that was passed to charter the Met by the legislature, by Tweed, opened to uh, insisted that the museum open four days a week to the public, and uh, it must be free. Um, that provision was only rescinded in 2018. Now, of course, people pay... $30, I believe it is, uh, to get into the Met. But uh, with that agreement secured, they now needed a place to house the, uh, the art. And the Parks Department, which was the person, the, the entity uh, that was involved in providing the land, uh, wanted the building built in Central Park. The majority of the Metropolitan thought trustees <laughs> actually voted against that. They thought that would be far too out of the city for people to travel. Fifth Avenue still had only a few frame houses on it along at Fifth Avenue and uh, all the way up at, uh, at uh, 80th Street uh, was considered the outer suburbs at the time. And so the uh, Met uh, board instead said, uh, how about this site? Uh, which you may recognize uh, Prudence there, the lion. Uh, this is, of course, the public library site now. This was the reservoir at the time, Fifth Avenue and 42nd, and, and that's what the Met trustees of the Metropolitan won. But the city, being a landlord, won on that argument, and it, what the uh, museum did, in fact, wind up in Central Park on the eastern edge uh, between 79th and 84th Streets. And the Natural History Museum actually uh, went up on the opposite side of the park. Uh, the park in 1873 was totally new, just a few years old, uh, still under construction. Uh, it, it's 
it looms large to us today because it is large, but uh, interestingly, it's not the largest park in New York. It's in fact, it's only the fifth largest park in New York City. Um, but like Central Park itself, the Met would essentially be dreamed up by a tiny group of men, uh, including Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vaux, who together designed the park. Um, and uh, the many of the members of the board actually wound up being enemies of Moss Tweed. And when Tweed fell in 1873, when he finally went to uh, prison, uh, the case against him was largely engineered by the same Joseph Choate that I've been uh, mentioning all along. So now with a site, but not yet a building, the museum set about to acquire some art, feeling that speed was necessary, of course. Henry Blodgett on the board sailed to Brussels and made a bulk purchase of a 174 European painting said to be by Rubens, Halls, Van Dyck, Goya, Velasquez, for which he paid $116,000, about $2 million in today's dollars. And it was money the museum didn't have. <laughs> so he hoped that he would pay for it himself and be reimbursed. And that actually did turn out. Unfortunate. Most of that art turned out to be entirely worthless. Um, and the rest of it, what that actually was somewhat uh, valuable, was way overvalued for what they paid. So the Mets' big first acquisition turned out to be a massive catastrophe. Blodgett became another in a long line of naive Americans swindled by unscrupulous art dealers uh, overseas. Uh, but worthless or not, they still needed a home. And 10 years after the founding, they finally had one in Central Park. The museum, by the way, is just off to the right here. It's not actually on this picture of the left half of the Central Park. So it was dedicated in 1880, and it looked like this. Um, uh, it was uh, uh, the the this is a design by uh, uh, Richard Henry Hunt. And this is um, uh, I'm sorry. This is a design by um, uh, let's I've forgotten the gentleman's name. Anyway, it's ugly as sin. <laughs> as you can see, it's in a style uh, called uh, Richardson Romanesque, I believe. Um, and uh, at its dedication in 1880, Joseph Choate gave a speech uh, welcoming, welcoming everybody and emphasize that the, this art once used to be the preserve of the rich and it's now going to be enjoyed by the working millions. And this is part of his speech. Probably no age and no city has ever seen such gigantic fortunes accumulated out of nothing as have been here piled up within the last five years. And it is right, the, New York was full of freshly minted millionaires at the time. Unfortunately, they were really all of them pretty much reluctant to provide any of the uh, uh, their resources, including art collections at the very beginning of the, um, of the uh, uh, Metropolitan. Here you see it today, and of course, it's the largest museum in the world in terms of square footage, an incredible 2 million square feet. There it is up there. Uh, 3.2 million visitors last year, and just a hair behind the National Gallery, uh, but still only half of the number that actually visited the museum back in 2017 before they started uh, charging admission. Two million objects in the collection, massive collection, although a, a, only a tiny fraction is on view at any one time. That, by the way, is the dirty little secret of art, all art museums. Uh, Still, that's uh, on the order of 100,000 items. And uh, it also, the Met is known for the, it doing by far more exhibitions every year than any other museum, uh, 30 on, on a typical year. There are now 17 separate curatorial departments. And as you can see, it's now set in the most chic neighborhood of the city. Uh, I recently saw Nova on this and Daniel Weiss, the uh, board president, they don't have a chair, but they have a president, uh, said when he got the job of board president, he was told his job was to get 
the art that is all lining on Fifth Avenue in apartments across the street into the uh, Metropolitan. But back to the museum's very humble origins. Uh, its first employee uh, and director was a man, this man, Luigi, or Louis, as he called himself later, Pesnoli. He was Italian, born in Turin, fought for the Italian army in Crimea, moved to the U.S. in 1860, uh, joined the army. He, he considered himself a soldier, first of all, uh, and was accused of uh, stealing army property and sending it north. He was threatened with dishonorable discharge and dismissed. Fortunately, before that happened, he was taken prisoner, spent months in a Confederate prison. He was roundly hated by everybody. Uh, but after he was cashiered out of the army, uh, he used his connections to secure a diplomatic patronage job. Uh, the best he could find was the American consul in Cyprus. Uh, and incidentally, at the time, um, consuls basically was a part-time job. So they sometimes worked for different countries. And in fact, he picked up a job being part-time consul for Russia and a couple of other, other countries as well. He realized that there were properties, uh, artifacts to be found lying around if you did dug for them in the island of uh, Cyprus. And he started uh, digging them out and selling them off. And uh, the artifacts were, quote, as thoroughly my property as anything could ever be the property of anyone, as he thought. And that was the rule then, finders keepers. Um, he had rather some underhanded techniques, I would say, though. Uh, the Turks, the Ottoman Turks running Cyprus at the time, noticed the uh, rather high value of the artifacts being taken and issued an injunction against the artifacts leaving the uh, island says Nola uh, noticed that the injunction prevented the, quote, American consul from shipping them out of the country. So he shipped them out as in his role as Russian consul. <laughs> so they arrived in New York. He offered them up to the Met for $60,000. This is maybe 7,000 or so pieces of uh, Cypri uh, ancient Cy uh, Cypriot art. Uh, the board president at the time uh, paid it with his own money. The Met had no money to acquire things then. And in return, Cesnola was offered a seat on the board, and he parlayed that into being the full time, first full time employee, the first, Met's first paid director, even though he had no training and no credentials in art. He never did a bit of documentation as to his findings. So uh, he was accused in 1880 of faking artifacts, putting things together from different eras, actually went to trial. Um, but uh, Cesnola, Escaped that, survived several attempts to depose him from the board, finally died in office in 1904. Uh, but he did have to say about him, he did succeed in expanding the building in his first 20 years. There's a recent uh, program of his collection, which is still much of it, uh, the part that wasn't uh, uh, faked in the Met collection. Um, there's actually the facade, the Richard Morris Hunt facade. Uh, and the original design and the, and the design as it looked in 1902, you've probably the big difference between the two, as you can see, is that the sculptures intended were never completed until this day. That's basically just blocks of stone up there um, that uh, was never carried out. Um, in the 1890s, the museum would be caught up in an extremely heated controversy, Sunday opening. This was the only day off for the vast majority of the workers in New York. And it became the first of a long series of populist versus elitist wars on the board primarily of, of, the, uh, of the Metropolitan. And to show you a contrary, this is a, the English magazine Puck uh, writing up on the controversy. Uh, and this shows the Metropolitan with uh, people including this a uh, crying child here being locked out of the Metropolitan on Sundays. Uh, so this became a, quite a worldwide controversy. Um, uh, Choate and the younger trustees favored opening it, as did Cesnola, but the board as a whole adamantly refused and nobody more so than this gentleman, William C. Prime. Uh, in eight, back in 1881, uh, 10,000 working people signed a petition to open it, and most of the newspapers were, were behind that. 
uh, up in Boston. The MFA had actually opened to the public in 1876, five years earlier. But the Metropolitan Board said no, and because they didn't want to break the Sabbath. They didn't. They thought people, uh, in, including uh, Prime, who was a, a Presbyterian, uh, thought that uh, this would be uh, ungodly to actually work and allow people to go attend museums on Sunday. So uh, finally, a newspaper ran a series exposing the fact that the museum actually was opened on Sunday, but only for a few special guests of the board. The poor were turned away. So that uh, caused the board to finally reconsider. And on May 9th of 1891, 12,000 people passed through the doors on its first Sunday uh, being open. Uh, and Sunday too, remains today the most popular day of the week for attendance, but it was fiercely controversial at the time. And the Met at this time slowly began acquiring collections of uh, major uh, collectors. I won't talk about all of them, but these people are definitely worth mentioning. Henry Havmeyer and his wife, Louisine, uh, he had made his uh, fortune in sugar, uh, American sugar, now Domino. He was kept off the board in 1891 because he was supposedly hard to get along with. But his wife um, created with him, largely led the, the acquisition of a uh, really one of the best collections at the time. Um, incidentally, he previously had been married to her aunt. Um, but when she died, he uh, then married his wife's niece. Um, as you can see, Louise Havemeyer was a close friend of Mary Cassatt, who did this uh, uh, pastel of her. And so she began collecting French Impressionists, which were still the object of critical outrage at the time, very much so in France, less so in the US. She collected uh, Courbet and then Manet and then Degas, numerous others. Uh, Havemeyer was not a fan of nudes, however, and he drew the line at uh, acquiring Manet's Olympia which is uh, now uh, uh, in a show at the Metropolitan and is currently the highlight of the Musée d'Orsay's collection. They also bought old uh, Renaissance old masters um, and they built a mansion on Fifth Avenue and 66 to house the collection. Louis Louisine herself is quite an interesting character. And in, in 1919, at the ripe old age of 63, she was arrested with a group of suffragettes in front of the White House and despite Lots of pressure from her absolutely horrified family. She refused to post bail and she spent five nights in a DC jail. Um, but after her death uh, in, in 1929, uh, uh, the Met uh, received this massive collection of 2000 artworks, uh, 4,500 actually altogether, counting the ones she'd given before her death and after. And as I say, it was the first time really that Impressionists entered any American museum. So they were ahead of their, their time. Uh, I just have to point out a, a few of them. This is uh, uh, Manet, uh, Degas, and th this Manet, I consider personally the beginning of Impressionism. Uh, this is the day in which uh, Manet uh, and uh, uh, um, and uh, has, uh, forgotten the other artist's name. Uh, forgive me, see you in a moment. Uh, sat together, not side by side, and painted the same impressionist picture, and basically launched uh, the movement. Uh, so that breathtaking moment is captured in in this painting, very much a masterpiece in the Metropolitan's collection. Now, uh, its first Cezanne also came to the museum. Uh, Cezanne at the time, his pictures were very cheap, uh, one fifth that of Monet, and that wasn't terribly expensive to begin with. But uh, this was the, again the first four way into what was known as advanced French art. Uh, so, unlike Morgan and Frick and Walters and Gardner and, and uh, Albert Barnes, uh, although they could have done so, the Havemeyers did not have their own museum. They basically contributed their art entirely to the Metropolitan. Incidentally, the young Albert Barnes in 1915 gave them quite an accolade. He said, uh, the collectors are all superb with Havemeyer easily the first in importance in art rather than in names. Uh, 
Uh, he said one could study, Barnes said, he could, one could study art and its relationship to life to better advantage in the Havemeyer collection than in any single gallery in the world. And uh, incidentally, the, it is the H.O. Havemeyer connection. Uh, Louise did not, according to the terms of her will, put her name uh, as a uh, co uh, uh, benefactor. The other major collection at the time was Benjamin Altman, uh, a great early collector, more, a little more conventional, uh, but he established the uh, Altman, B. Altman's department store. He died in 1913 and left the Met the greatest bequest it had ever received up to that point. Uh, he was considered the first of a long series of great American Jewish collectors. Uh, he lived extremely quietly. He avoided publicity of any kind. Uh, when he died, there was no photograph that the newspaper could use for his obit. Uh, never married. Uh, he only began to seriously collect art at the age of 65 in 1905. Uh, and he died eight years later, but in, in the interim, he amassed a, a massive collection, uh, including this gem uh, from the Northern Renaissance, uh, the Portinari. The Portinaris were, in fact, the uh, commissioners of the Portinari altarpiece on the Uffizi, which is also famous. And uh, Rembrandt's. Uh, Altman was was a was a an enlightened dealer. Uh, he was guided in some way by uh, some ways by Joseph Devine, a man we'll eat, uh, meet later, and also by uh, Bernard Berenson. Uh, but he wanted his whole collection to be kept and displayed together. The Met doesn't like to do that. They like to have collections uh, chronologically and so forth in in various departments. But J. P. Morgan, who was a trustee at the time, okayed it over the uh, Met's reluctance. So it's now dispersed, but at the time there was a provision in the will that it be uh, uh, displayed separately as the Altman collection. Altman left 13 Rembrandts to the Metro, uh, plus Holbein, Botticelli, Vermeer, the, the, the museum's first Vermeer, uh, Hals, uh, Velasquez, uh, Van Dyck, Giorgione. Uh, this self-portrait, uh, one of the most striking of the 40 uh, self-portraits that Rembrandt painted, to me anyway, painted in, in 1660, which was a terrible year, by the way, for Rembrandt. He had just declared bankruptcy and seen his collection of art uh, auctioned off. And yet I think there's a defiance uh, in this expression, certainly no trace of the defeat. And this pairs well, I believe, with uh, the Frick portrait painted two years earlier. Uh, here is Rembrandt in a costume of the previous century. Uh, both of these together certainly are uh, two of the greatest uh, Rembrandt self-portraits that I know of. There's weariness, there's heaviness, but there's not defeat. Now we come to this man, uh, J.P. Morgan. <laughs> uh, everybody is fierce as this uh, picture makes him out to be. There is no J.P. Morgan collection per se in the Metropolitan. All there is is a uh, plaque on the wall on the left as you enter it uh, that says J. John Pierpont Morgan Memorial Vita Plena Laboris, a life full of work. But he became a trustee in 1888. He began donating uh, in 1897. He became president, crucially, of the board in 1904, just in time to see uh, Cesnola's replacement. A banker, uh, but when railroads or mines or mills ran into trouble, the, he basically took them over and ran them until they were profitable again, the bank takeover. And he did this in a staggering number of cases uh, and led to staggering profits. So this is an era where there was no central bank and Morgan famously single-handedly acted to prevent catastrophe. In 1895, when the went ran out of gold and once again in 1907, when Wall Street faced a, uh, a liquidity crisis. There was no one else in the country that could do what he did. And as, as you can guess uh, from this uh, photo, he was absolutely terrifying to deal with, utterly intimidating. He founded or ran pretty much all of these corporations and he was a voracious collector, probably the most prodigious holder of art objects in all of history. 
he acquired on a truly imperial scale. He seemed to want all the beautiful things in the world, as one biography said of him. He chased and acquired objects exactly as he did companies. Uh, the London Times said of the Morgan Library, uh, one out of 10 uh, rich people has taste, one out of 100 has genius. Mr. Frick, Mr. Altman, Mr. Widener in America, and the late Rodolphe Kahn in Paris come under the former category, but the man of genius is John Pierpont Morgan. Uh, but there was a problem. Oh, incidentally, uh, all of these others, by the way, U.S. Steel, the largest corporation uh, to that date, international harvester, and they were all basically centered around his main bank, which is J.P. Morgan and Company. All of those still around. But the problem was that the art was not in America. It was in his London house where he, Morgan had grown up. He wanted to bring it to the U.S. He was now on the board of the Met, and he uh, unfortunately faced a 10% import tax. Well, that was a dilemma. He wanted it to bring us all this European to the art, but enter this man, Senator Aldrich of Rhode Island, uh, the father of Abby Aldrich, the wife, uh, future wife of uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr. We'll talk about her later. Um, and Aldrich was on the tax committee. He removed the restrictive tariff on fine art. The same year, by the way, he introduced the 16th Amendment to the Constitution, which allowed the income tax to happen. Uh, until then, uh, federal revenues are almost entirely uh, made up of tariffs. Um, Morgan thanked his friend and immediately began transferring his vast collection to the U.S. just ahead of the imposition of the estate tax in England, which would have cost him mightily at his death. Uh, the U.S. did not have an estate tax then. So all in all, Morgan perhaps saved himself $30 million or so. And I will tell you, one thing I have learned is changes in the tax laws inherently have a very outsized effect on the art market and on, on museums. One of his, Morgan's best things to do was to, here we see him, by the way, I have to tell you, this is Sykin's photo of him. Uh, <laughs> one of the more iconic photos ever made. Uh, Morgan did not like this photo much, uh, but I think it captures him uh, perfectly. It almost looks like a dagger in his hands there, which is just the edge of his chair. Uh, Morgan brought to the museum a respected candidate, the most respected candidate in the world to replace Cezanova, Sir Caspar Purden Clark. Clark had been uh, director, uh, he'd been at the South Kensington Museum, which uh, is now known as the Victoria and Albert, and had run it for a decade. Uh, he'd been there 40 years. Somehow, uh, Morgan persuaded him to take the job in America uh, at the Metropolitan, and he became really the first professional art collector and put the Met on its firm foundation professional feet. Um, there's a story when the South Kensington Museum secretary came back from a vacation or hiatus that winter, he asked about some porcelains that the museum had wanted. He was told Morgan had bought them. A set of tapestries he had similarly uh, tried to purchase. Morgan had bought them too. Good God, the secretary gasped. I must talk to Mr. Purton. Sorry, sir, the clerk allegedly said. Mr. Morgan has bought him also. So Morgan transferred all of the cases of collection to the basement of the Metropolitan, started putting them on display, but still retained ownership of it. I think the assumption at the time was that they would go to the museum at its death. It didn't quite work out that way. Uh, since he, Morgan was given the staggering amount of uh, perhaps $50 million in art, Morgan assumed that the city would in turn would be able to build a new wing, which would perhaps cost $5 million or so at the very most. Alas, the newspapers caught wind of it and screamed headlines protesting having the taxpayer's dollars provide accommodations for perhaps the richest man in the world. So JPM held back from announcing his donation, but he kept buying art. Meanwhile, he put a lot of money into this gorgeous thing, this is uh, the Morgan Library they hold, to hold this vast collection of rare books and manuscripts. 
And this was the very room where Morgan cowed the dozen or so key bankers in 1907 into colluding to save the US economy, economy from collapse. Um, this had just opened the year before that in 1906, and it's adjacent, directly adjacent to his home on Madison and 36. It was later given to the public by a foundation. This is architect Charles McKim's masterpiece in the Italian Renaissance. Um, in 1928, the old Morgan residence next door was demolished so that it could add a large annex to this building. But uh, this, as you can see, is the restored personal library of Morgan. Um, in 2006, uh, Renzo Piano tied it all together beautifully and added a 75,000 square foot addition in a beautiful uh, piece of uh, collection. This is the actual opening of the museum, um, New York Times, March 1905, the uh, building actually of the uh, Morgan Library building. Now we come to this lady. She was one of the most remarkable stories uh, in art in the 20th century. She was the force behind the Morgan Library. Uh, and her story is incredible. Should be better known than it is. In 1905, when Morgan was just accumulating his world class collection and he just completed his $2 million building to hold it, he needed somebody to run it. As luck would have it, J.P.'s nephew, uh, Junius Morgan, was a student at Princeton at the time, and he was quite impressed with the knowledge of a young uh, uh, librarian in the uh, Rare Books Library there, and he recommended that J.P. call her down for an interview. Now, as you know, as you can tell, J.P. Morgan was a very intimidating man, and she was uh, doubtless terrified, as everyone reports, being in Morgan's presence. But Morgan actually was quite impressed and soon hired her, despite the fact that it was uh, really extremely unusual for women to be employed at all, and certainly rare in specialized uh, book libraries. But within three years, she was actually representing Morgan abroad, purchasing books and weeding out the many many forgeries that people tried to uh, foist on them. She became an expert in, in detecting forgeries, uh, and soon became the world's leading expert in general on illuminated manuscripts. The press loved her. Uh, here's a story from 1911, $50,000 for that book, quietly said Miss Belle de Costa Graves, the bachelor girl still in her 20s, who as J.P. Pier Pierpont Morgan's librarian has charge of the finest private collection of costly volumes in the world. Uh, she was earning $10,000 a year salary. This is 300,000 in today's dollars. And she was spending millions of dollars of JP Morgan's money, uh, buying books of only the highest quality. Uh, she was named the very first director of the Morgan and Library in 1924 when it became public and served until her retirement in that position in 1948, 42 years after. Morgan had first hired her at the age of 26. All this time, she harbored a deep secret that no one actually discovered until 1999, 50 years almost after her death. She was in fact a light-skinned black woman passing as white. She would certainly not have been able to accomplish all that she did had she had to overcome racial barriers in addition to gender barriers. Her father, though, had been Richard Greener, the first Black graduate of Harvard. Her mother was a light-skinned member of a, an African-American family in D.C. Uh, they divorced when Bill and, Bill and her sister were young, and the mother moved them to New York, where they changed their name to Green and passed as white. Bell herself invented the middle name De Costa and always claimed to have a Portuguese background to explain her dark features. Uh, incidentally, she most likely refused Morgan's attempts at uh, seduction. Mo Morgan was very much known as a lady man, ladies' man, uh, although she did, I will say, carry on a years-long affair with uh, the married Bernard Berenson, whom we'll hear much more about later. One of the companies that Morgan owned was the company that owned the White Star Lines. And they, of course, are the owners of the Titanic, uh, 
And for its maiden voyage in 1912, Morgan had uh, a personal suite that he was going to occupy on the ship. He attended the launch party, and planned to sail on that inaugural voyage, but at the last moment, changed his mind, decided to extend in his stay in Europe a few weeks longer. Uh, rather amazingly, Henry Clay Frick, whom we'll meet in uh, week three, and his wife also had tickets for this maiden voyage, but they also canceled after uh, his wife Adelaide had sprained an ankle in Italy and needed, uh, needed to rest. So Morgan missed out on that uh, desperate journey, although a whole lot of other artistic collectors and clients uh, did go down with the Titanic. But Morgan's overall health was in decline, and the very next year he died in a hotel in Rome. And as you can see, it caused headlines all over the world. The stock market closed to mark its passing, his passing, and uh, flags in Wall Street flew at half mast out of usually uh, a, a gesture only given for heads of state. For purposes of our story here, though, that left the great question open: What would happen to the greatest? collection of art and artifacts ever assembled by one man. Well, the terms of Morgan's will left it in the hands of his son, uh, Jack Jr., J.P. Morgan Jr. And the answer was, uh, you know, Morgan's will did not give them to the Metropolitan. And again, perhaps he was miffed that the city would not uh, build the house for him. But in any case, um, Jack now had the decision, and Jack soon encountered a huge problem. J.P.'s will had been quite generous to hundreds of people, and between that and the state taxes uh, on the estate, uh, there was an acute shortage of liquid assets uh, to pay off the estate's debts. Uh, J.P. had spent tirelessly and quite profligately to acquire art, so much so that Jack did not have enough art to uh, enough uh, ready cash to cover the estate costs. And so the unfortunate upshot was that to cover uh, the uh, uh, expenses, he had to um, deaccession about uh, more than half of the collection, 60% or so. Jack did work with the trustees of the Met, uh, which he was now, of which he was now a member, uh, to try and keep the most important city uh, pieces. And nevertheless, the remaining 40% of that gargantuan collection was enormous. Some of it came to other collectors and eventually did wind up in the uh, Metropolitan as well. In any case, that explains why there's no Morgan Wing today, although the collection vast is still vast and it's uh, dispersed uh, across the museum. Uh, he likely, I would say, is the single greatest benefactor ever uh, to the Metropolitan. And like I say, today, he really only has that small plaque on the wall. Uh, he had, however, his legacy is that he turned the museum into a truly professionally managed museum, competitive with the great museums of uh, Europe. As a collector, as I mentioned, he was in a class of one. Uh, he typically purchased not only indiv not individual objects, but whole collections. And no one else could do this. Uh, he clearly actually favored religious objects. Uh, he had a, 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 his, particularly those reflecting his own Christian faith. Um, there were 7,000 objects that Jack donated from the collection between 1913 and the final transfer in 1917. And these remain, uh, this is the final transfer, uh, remain really the, the very highest quality and the very highest quality in the Met's uh, vast holdings. In the 20s and 30s, the Met acquired a significant new branch, its only branch to this day, and that requires talking about the second greatest factor in its history. The Met Cloisters is a pastiche, a mashup of different works from different centuries. And the progenitor of it is a man you've doubtless never heard of. If there's one person who is most responsible for the idea of the cloisters, it's George Gray Bernard, uh, mostly unacknowledged today. Uh, Bernard was a sculptor, and as you can see, he liked to do Lincoln's head. This is a creditable, I would say, version sculpture of Lincoln's head in the Metropolitan Collection. Uh, his other major uh, work is the 
uh, front of the Pennsylvania State Capitol. When he did this, he uh, immediately moved to Europe to complete it, uh, Bernard did. And while he was there, he began to uh, stretch his income by uh, going around and collecting uh, goods and uh, masonry pieces from um, various uh, abbeys and cloisters, uh, which resonated to him. Uh, in these pre-World War I years, if you look for them, they were everywhere. Uh, there weren't particularly laws against uh, exporting them. And soon he had pieces of several cloisters in his studio in France. Meantime, John D. Rockefeller Jr., well, I'll, I'll get to him. John D. Rockefeller Jr. was building a house in called Kikit in Pocantico Hills in, in suburban New York. Bernard, and particularly do, uh, the dealer Joseph Devine, tried selling these cloisters to J.P. Morgan, who wasn't interested. Duveen heard that and Bernard was doing that and immediately went to Bernard and said, look, I will sell the artifacts. These are my clients. Don't horn in on my territory. You can do what you want with the masonry. So Devine, who was, uh, as I say, the greatest art dealer of all time, uh, basically uh, got involved and did wind up furnishing uh, the uh, uh, furniture at uh, Kaikit. Um, So John D. Rockefeller Jr., there he is, uh, there's his family. And interestingly, uh, John and Abigail, again, this is Abigail uh, uh, Aldrich Rockefeller, um, had five sons. And John D. himself was the only son of the richest man in the world. But the five sons of John D. Jr. Uh, actually all turned out to be art patrons of one kind or another. Um, Rather remarkably, being the only son of the richest man in, the, in America did not really strangle John D's, John D. Jr.'s uh, personality. He grew up relatively normal and uh, had a quite loving and stable family of his own. He did have one problem, however. He tried uh, mightily to disassociate himself from the vast Rockefeller holdings, but it didn't work in one case. Uh, he was reluctantly drawn into a labor controversy in a small Colorado branch of his sprawling family business. Bear with me, this, this is very relevant to the, uh, uh, the Metropolitan, as you'll we'll see. Um, the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, there was an ugly dispute. And at one point uh, on April 1914, two women and 11 children who had hidden in a pit underneath a tent were uh, suffocated uh, when the tent was set ablaze. 21 people altogether were killed by the Colorado National Guard under the governor. Uh, J.D. Rockefeller had really very little to do with it, but he was blamed. For one thing, he had just testified two days earlier to Congress uh, on the strike. So he was thought to be more involved than he probably was. He started facing protests and bomb plots in New York. Uh, he, his intentions were good, I have to say, but his now, now his name was indelibly associated with a really uh, horrifying uh, labor problem, the Ludlow Massacre. And there's the National Guard with machine guns, uh, uh, which actually weren't used in the strike. The architect for Kikit was a man by the name of William Wells Bosworth. He had done the buildings at MIT, for example, they had a lovely Beaux-Arts style. Uh, and at one point, he proposed to Rockefeller that he use George Gray Bernard to sculpt some figures for the garden. As soon as Barnard learned who the client was, sensing an opportunity, he immediately tried to interest JDR in uh, making his monastery pieces into a museum at his studio in Manhattan. Now, Rockefeller was not interested. He firmly refused, insisting that Bernard go through Bosworth and leave him uh, alone from then on. Bosworth then, uh, realizing the problem with Rockefeller's reputation, wrote a memo in 1914 that tactfully suggested it might be helpful to Rockefeller's post-Ludlow massacre image to follow up on Bernard's idea. Bosworth says to JDR, I'm, certainly, I'm certain that it would be a substantial revelation to the public of a side of your nature, which many have not yet given you credit for. If you do this, you will have cleared your skirts 
forever. So that was the genesis of Rockefeller getting involved with the quote unquote cloisters. In 1925, uh, really 11 years later, uh, finally, after a long process, JDR informed the Met board that he would purchase the Bernard cloisters for $600,000 at Bernard's studio. Uh, and uh, Rockefeller, however, had a much grander sight in mind, and that's this for Tryon. It would take 16 years from that cleared skirts memo for this to be fully realized, but this is the magnificent result at Fort Tryon. Rockefeller had quietly bought up a lot of prime undeveloped land, amounting to 60 acres along the Hudson River above the George Washington Bridge, surrounding the highest point in Manhattan, what's now Fort Tryon Park. Rockefeller had actually been trying for quite a while to interest successive New York City mayors in taking the land as a park and wasn't able to do so. Finally, in 1929, the mayor acquiesced. And by 1930, uh, Rockefeller was ready to go public with all this. He would give the city the park and the Metropolitan and the museum. He would also pay for the landscaping of all 60 acres, total gift of $13 million. And very pointedly, he refused to name the museum branch for himself. There was only one person unhappy, and that was George Gray Bernard. So despite Bernard's flooding of newspapers with his own claims to have been the genius behind the cloisters, Bernard wasn't even invited to the 1930 dedication, and it's hard to find his name in the uh, current Met uh, historical resources. This is the view across the river from the cloisters, and I want to mention that Rockefeller also bought up most of that land to, so that there would be a pristine view from the cloisters site. And so we I have to give him a major credit for uh, much of that beauty. As I say, the Met is a pastiche. It consists of multiple uh, uh, cloisters. This is the cloisters of Cuxa, the, the uh, uh, masonry from that. This is a Benedictine monastery from the foothills of the Pyrenees in Spain. Founded in the year 1878, the cloisters itself dates to uh, the 12th century. The term cloister refers to a covered walkway surrounding a garden. So this is a place for uh, meditation and uh, reading aloud. This was a Bernard find, and this is probably the best of his, um, and has lovely carved balustrades there, as you can see. As for the Metropolitan Collection as a whole, my favorite piece in it, it probably shouldn't be there because it's really, I would say, early Renaissance rather than medieval. But this is the Robert Campin's Marode altarpiece. And it is a glory uh, from uh, uh, the Netherlands and the Low Countries. Uh, to my mind, this is one of the finest works in the uh, Met's entire collection. But it's in the cloisters because John D. Rockefeller Jr. bought it and put it there. <laughs> So as I say, there are multiple uh, cloisters at the cloisters. Uh, Saint Guillaume de Désert, one of uh, Bernard's finds as well. Uh, this was on the pilgrimage tour uh, of Saint James in Northern Spain, very popular in the medieval era. Uh, the Bonifant is no longer called that because it's such a collection of different sites. Uh, the tree cloisters from a Carmelite convent uh, near Toulouse, 15th century, probably, probably late. 15th century that has marble capitals with carved scenes from the New Testament. Uh, the cross is from, from uh, assembled, I would say, together. That's a pastiche as well from 15th century elements. And this is one of the glories, uh, the Gothic chapel. This is an, uh, also an assemblage of multiple element, elements. The windows are from uh, South Austria, 1340. Uh, stained glass from Normandy around 1325, six two effigies from Catalonia and Normandy. Surprisingly, it's a rather harmonious whole, I would say. And there's this also, another, this is really a glorious uh, area as well, the Funta Duena Chapel, a Romanesque apse from uh, 1175 to 1200 or so in, uh, near uh, Segovia. Uh, this was acquired by Rockefeller, not by uh, uh, Bernard in the 30s, Rebuilt in the 40s, but it was not opened until 1961. 
a lot of hang-ups in between, including the World War II. Um, uh, inside the dome is a large fresco dating to 1130. And uh, the crucifix is about 1150 to 1200 or so from uh, Ast Astudillo in Spain. The glory of the collection to most people is the unicorn tapestries. There are actually seven of them representing the hunt and the capture of the uniform, uh, unicorn. And these are actually among the best preserved tapestries in the high Middle Ages. Uh, dense with foliage and flowers and exotic animals. And mysteriously, the initials A and E intertwined on each. Um, based on the clothing, it was probably designed in Paris. Uh, woven around 1495 to 1505, probably in Brussels. Uh, this was called by one art historian, the greatest inheritance of the Middle Ages, made of uh, luxuriously fine wool and silk with silver and gold threads, uh, loaded with medieval sim symbols that scholars still love to disagree about today. Rockefeller had secretly bought them in 1922 and uh, uh, brought them out again in 1936. In addition to the cloisters, Rockefeller was also funding the museum. Uh, he never joined the board. He was asked and actually voted onto the board multiple times and kept declining. But he uh, just, by the way, tossed in the same time he was doing the cloisters to the Met itself, the Nimrod reliefs. Uh, he also, by the way, on, on the other scores, he restored Versailles, and the cathedral at Rem at this time as well, all anonymously. He also built uh, Williamsburg uh, at this moment and numerous other charitable works actually on his own, all almost completely anonymous, certainly at first because he wished to avoid uh, paying Rockefeller prices. Um, as I say, Nelson never joined the board, but actually his son did, uh, his son Nelson, uh, almost fresh out of the Prince uh, Yale uh, himself, I guess, joined the board, but he warned the trustees of the Metropolitan when he joined that his tastes were quite different from his father's. He liked modern art. And if it ever came to a conflict with between the Met and the brand new Museum of Modern Art, which his mother was founding at the time, he would favor them, not the Metropolitan. So on those two provisos, he joined the board of the Metropolitan. He was all of 21 years old, and he would serve actually on both the Museum of Modern Art and the Met boards for decades, uh, and eventually became the president of, um, of MoMA. One of the important directors of the Met, not the board president, but the director is James Warner, this uh, gentleman. He was a curator of medieval art during the time that Rockefeller was building the cloisters. So he and Rockefeller were very close. As shown here, uh, he is one of the monuments men during World War II. Uh, and he returned to the Met after the war and served as director of the full Met, not just the cloisters from 1955 to 1966. He was a great scholar. He had one serious blind spot, and that is modern art. He really despised it. There, there's Romer in the back on this end. And this, uh, of course, Jackson Pollock uh, masterpiece. In 1952, the curator of the Met of, of, of Modern Arts, quote unquote, Robert Hale, had purchased one of Jackson Pollock's first drip paintings. Five years later, after Pollock had died, he made a deal with uh, the Janus Gallery to trade that early masterpiece for this. This is a much larger one. Uh, the museum apparently could, would only sustain having one Jackson Pollock in its collection. Um, but this is uh, huge, as you can see in this picture. And uh, after it was hung in 1958, the Met board president said to Hale, you know, Bobby, you've ruined my museum. So that tells you how even as late as 1958, uh, the Metropolitan Board, if not its staff, was really quite opposed to the vast changes that had gone on in contemporary art in the 20th century. Hence, we have the Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney Gallery, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. And the next director after uh, Rorimer, Thomas Hoving. I'm sure you've heard him. Rorimer discovered him. 
when uh, Hoving was a grad student at Princeton, still a grad student, he gave a talk at a Frick conference, which was known as a meat market for art students. And afterwards, Rorimer, without introducing himself, came up and asked him if he wanted to view a Renaissance table in his office. Well, Hoving had no idea who he was. They walked over to the Metropolitan and walked up to Rorimer's office uh, as director of the Met. <laughs> and Hoving knew that he was the director, but he still didn't know his name. So Hoving finally managed to see his name on a piece of correspondence on the desk. So he figured out it was Rorimer talking to him. Uh, Rorimer asked Hoving about job offers. Hoving said he'd been interviewed by a couple of dealers. Rorimer said, if you go to a dealer, you'll never work at any museum in the US. If you go to a museum, you can later work, if you like, at any dealer shop in the world. So Hoving was clearly being recruited and he joined uh, the, as a curatorial assistant at the Cloisters as, and as a personal assistant to Rorimer. When Rorimer was moved up to Met Director, Hoving replaced him at the Cloisters, very much a rising star at the Cloisters. Hoving's claim to fame, what made him famous at the Cloisters, is that he had done his uh, PhD thesis on medievals, medieval I ivories, and he personally brought to the Met this masterpiece from uh, uh, a, uh, a a seal tusk, a walrus tusk, actually. And this is likely from the Church of Barry St. Edmunds, and uh, not completely a agreement on that. He bought it from a flamboyant and very shady Yugoslav dealer. I won't go into that, but he, he, the dealer had basically nothing but fakes and then this. But Hoving was convinced it was real and uh, uh, managed to convince first the Cloisters uh, and then the Metropolitan Board to spend $600,000 on it. And uh, so far it stood up to scrutiny. But Hoving was not telling one thing. He did not emphasize one thing when they, he brought it to the board. And that is with all its stunning artistry, it has several representations of virulent anti-Semitism. Hoving said later, it was as if Hitler and Michelangelo had gotten together to make this thing. Uh, curators at the Cloisters today disagree a little bit and quietly, I would say, downplay some of Hoving's theories. But the anti-Semitic sayings are clearly there. And it's a reminder of the virulent anti-Semitism of the late 12th century, uh, leading up to Edward I's banishing of the uh, uh, entire race in, in 1290. But in November 1965, Hoving surprised everyone at the Met by leaving it and becoming Parks Commissioner under John Lindsay. Now remember the Parks Commission actually is the Met's landlord. So Hoving would be on the board meetings as the Met's landlord. So in 1967, after what Hoving later claimed was a very contentious board meeting, Rorimer went home and suddenly died that night in his sleep. So a contingent on the board, including Brooks Astor, wanted Hoving as his replacement. But Hoving got the nod only after at least a dozen other people had turned down the job. Hoving's first order of business as a director was to reel in the Lehman Collection, the greatest collection of art then in private hands. Hirshhorn had just gone at that point to the Smithsonian where uh, Dylan Ripley had engineered Congress to authorize a brand new building on the mall for it. This is the new parts of the Metropolitan, basically all editions that Hoving was pretty much responsible for. And you can see it, it's massive. We're gonna talk about a few of them, but let me first talk about the Lehman Wing. Lehman wanted the collection to stay intact in a new wing. Again, that's usually very difficult to get past the board. But more importantly, Lehman felt aggrieved at being passed over as board president in 1964. He, he blamed anti-Semitism for that. Uh, the addition looks small here perhaps, but it's actually about the same size as the Guggenheim Museum up the street and the Frank Lloyd Wright building, which we'll talk about in a few weeks as well. Lehman had been CEO forever of the Lehman Brothers from 1925 until his death in 1969. And for 60 years, uh, Robert Lehman had been acquiring old masters. His father actually 
had begun the collection and had been a considerable collector as well. And it was, as I say, the finest collection at that point in private hands in America, perhaps $100 million. Uh, Lehman had also served on the board of trustees since the early 40s. Uh, he, was, uh, he had what was known as the Jewish seat that left vacant at the time by uh, banker George Blumenthal. So in 1957, uh, uh, Lehman actually had 300 of his best works at a solo exhibition at the Louvre, at the L'Orangerie. Uh, this was a distinction given to no one else, certainly not to any other uh, American collectors. But Lehman had never formally promised his collection to the Met, and it appeared that, just like J.P. Morgan, uh, the a Met would again lose this vast collection. So Hoving went to have a talk with him. And according to Hoving's memoir, which may not be entirely reliable, the two of them headed off immediately. Hoving asked the museum if he had any chance at his collection. Lehman just chuckled and said, it's going to be fun being a trustee once again. So it turned out, again, Lehman had been miffed to be passed over as board president. Hoving finessed that by having the board create a new post of chairman uh, to which Lehman was immediately elected. Lehman uh, also wanted his collection, of course, to remain together. And this time the Met, unlike with Morgan, acquiesced. So. All of the collection had been in the Lehman Mansion at uh, 7 West 54th Street, right across, by the way, from John D. Rockefeller's home. Uh, he had a Botticelli, which actually had been a gift by Robert Lehman uh, to his father. Um, uh, Holbein, uh, all of it displayed in period furnished rooms, as you can see like this. The Lehman collection in, uh, in the original house uh, was uh, open on occasion. And as you can see, a vast collection just of Madonnas all in, encompassing one wall. There's the Botticelli I spoke of. Uh, and there's the Hans Holbein the Younger, uh, this penetrating portrait. Hope, Erasmus in gratitude to the painter uh, wrote a letter of introduction to Holbein to his fellow humanist Thomas Moore, which led to the great Holbein portrait now at the Frick, and also to uh, ultimately to Holbein's becoming court painter to the court of uh, Henry VIII. So the Lehman collection, it's called the wing here, but it's not a pavilion, that's, that was considered the wrong word, opened in 1975. It now contains about 3,000 works of art, staggeringly rich, especially in Italian and Northern European Renaissance. Only a small portion on view at any one time, but they're rotated regularly. So you never know what you're gonna see when you, when you go uh, to look. There are seven rooms that were actually recreated from the Lehman's mansion as a tribute to the donor. That also was a proviso in his will. But it's safe to say the Met has never given up more to get a single donor's collection. And now I wanna talk a little bit about the Temple of Dendur. Hoving's 10 years at the Met were marked by uh, <laughs> a huge number of controversies, uh, all of which, by the way, he relates with startling candor in his memoir called Making the Mummies Dance, which I uh, recommend. Uh, certainly one of his earliest battles was the battle for the Temple of Denver, Dender. It was by no means a given that the Metropolitan would get this. Uh, Egypt was offering it to the U.S. in gratitude for its help with moving other more significant antiquities from an area soon to be inundated by the new Aswan High Dam. Uh, the Temple of Dender is really not that ancient by Egyptian standards. It's a Roman era, actually. And in fact, Caesar Augustus is actually depicted on it in, uh, in relief as an Egyptian pharaoh, interestingly. Um, here is the temple shown in a 19th century drawing and as it looked in situ before it was moved. The government, US government announced a competition to host it and things very quickly became political. The Dender Derby, as it was called. Boston, New York, Washington, and Memphis and Cairo, Illinois actually, <laughs> because of the name largely, all were supposedly com competitors and all thought they would be good. All of them proposed citing the temple outdoors 
at the Washington, the Smithsonian is going to put it on the banks of the Potomac, rather near where the Kennedy Center is now. Um, reportedly, it was Jackie Kennedy who urged that to happen uh, and requested $10 million uh, to do so because she wanted the temple sited in DC as a memorial to him. So the Metropolitans faced some formidable competition, but hoving on the Met one based on placing it indoors and protecting it from the elements in this, I have to say, lovely new space, which was called until recently the Sackler Wing, um, was finally unveiled uh, just a month before Hoving's blockbuster exhibit, The Treasures of Tutankhamun, which drew an astounding 8 million visitors. So that Hoving was on a roll in his first few years as a director. Um, I want to talk also a little bit about the Ameri African American Oceanic Wing. Hoving also uh, turned his attention to that. This is really three separate collections Sub Saharan Africa, Ancient American Art, and Oceanic Art. Uh, and they're all together largely because they're pretty much a gift from Nelson Rockefeller, who had them all on view in his own private museum of indigenous art, as he called it, uh, originally called primitive art, and he changed that. Um, and uh, that, that existed until the 60s. Michael Rockefeller was not Nelson's son. He had disappeared at the age of 23 in the jungles of New Guinea. And by 1975, Nelson himself had lost interest in a standalone museum. And so he decided that at his death, his entire collection would go to the Met along with funds to build a new wing, which was to be named the Michael C. Rockefeller collection. So that opened up in 1982. It's currently in the process of a redesign, but that's what it looks like. So now a little bit on the wing for modern art. The Metropolitan, as I say, had always had a very conservative bias against modern art. They refused to have the work of living analysts. And I got to tell you, I am running way behind. So let me actually park right here, see what questions we have. And then I'll capture the rest of this uh, in uh, a quick summary at the, the beginning of next week. So let me um, see if there are questions in the chat. And again, I invite you to put questions in the chat. If you've not done so, you can also raise your hand if you prefer that way. Uh, OK, there's a comment. Is, is Joseph Choate in, oh, shoot. Sorry, is Joseph Choate and Enro related were they to the boarding school in Connecticut? Uh, yes, I believe that is his work as well. Uh, Rose Mary Hill School, okay. Uh, there is a Choate uh, school, a prep school, which is, uh, I believe, a name for his family. Uh, per the Metropolitan's online policy, we suggest the following admission prices. Yes, technically they don't charge for uh, New York City residents, they do charge for anybody else. They can, you can, if you're a resident, give any amount, but you must give something. So few New York City residents pay uh, the full $30. Uh, but most of the people coming to the Metropolitan are from out of town, so they wind up doing it. Uh, total number of employees must be huge. Yeah, okay, there's the... Uh, That hand, okay, a comment from Sherry Renoir. I think I lost that comment. Maybe I misspoke, I don't know. Uh, will the seminar be available to rewatch? Uh, it will if you're Ollie, get in touch with Ollie how to do that. I think, I'm not sure about AARP. Uh, was J.P. Morgan's collection larger than what the Nazis stole? Uh, <laughs> hard to say. I, I'm actually probably not equipped to say that, but certainly it was uh, challenging, uh, that uh, record. Sorry. There might, I think that may be all the comments. So if you want to raise a hand, we can go ahead and do that. Uh, while you're doing that, I'm going to share a screen again. And go down here to 
the end and share. If you're interested in further reading, let me invite you to. Sorry. Recommended books. For those of you who like it, uh, these are the books I used in preparing this. So if anybody wants to raise your hand, go ahead. Otherwise, we'll close it off here until next week. One person raised their hand. Okay, you can go ahead and acknowledge them. Linda. Uh, Spencer, if you're here, I think you have to enable Linda. Um, I did. We do have some hands raised now. Yeah. Um, what about Ed then? Spencer, okay. do you know how to <clears throat> enable him? I can't do that. I, am I enabled? Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Tom, great talk. I Ed, really, how are you? Have, good, good to hear I'm you. doing well. Uh, it's good to see you here, but uh, this was fantastic. I, I'm really looking forward to the next several ones too. Um, uh, and this may be something you cover a little bit later, but I was always curious with the, the existence of both the Met and MoMA, if there's a, a dividing line that will always separate them in time, or do you see that the, the Met will continue to evolve and maybe adopt a, a larger percentage of uh, modern art, or will they always cede that to, to MoMA? An excellent question, which I will park for next week. Uh, actually, I was going to cover that in some of the slides coming up. Very briefly, there was a moment when it appeared as if the Met and MoMA and the Whitney would all combine forces, and that evaporated. But the reason there are three museums rather than one is primarily because in the 1929-30 era, the Met basically refused to acknowledge that any contemporary art was worth having. And so the, engender, the people who engendered those two museums, uh, uh, Whitney and uh, Rockefeller for the MoMA, basically had to do so. They had to produce, make their own museums. So now New York has three, thank you very much, and uh, is very off, well off for it. They all basically collect modern art as well. Uh, I will say the difference between the Whitney and MoMA is MoMA originally started out heavily emphasizing European art, uh, modern art, uh, and uh, the Whitney is totally contemporary Americans. We'll talk much more about that next week. Interesting stories there. Thank you. Hey, Susan. Go ahead. Yeah, hey, thank you. So actually somebody has a good question about the cross, which I'm interested in hearing more about, but I just, I, I may have missed your answer to this question, but do you, do you feel like the huge loss in the number of people that are visiting um, is more than offset by the admission? Because uh, I know some people of course weren't paying, right? I mean, are they accomplishing well, that's, they that's a good question. I, saw, I know that's still debated. Uh, the fact is the deficits were such that they had no choice. When they instituted it, New York was in the midst of a fiscal crisis. They're all a little better off now for it. But still, uh, you know, in terms of what other museums charge, particularly European muse uh, museums overseas, it's not particularly out of line. Maybe the fees are a little bit higher than uh, the Louvre or the National Gallery, but pretty much Washington and its Smithsonian's is the exception to the rule right now. All museums are forced to charge and, uh, and the government subsidies are just insufficient to make them free. Thank you. And then Jennifer. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, you, I, I got interrupted by a crazy amount of phone calls that I at least had to see who it was, uh, one I had to take. So I'm trying to figure out how to uh, access the recording that you've been making of this whole thing. And But to someone okay, else, let, you answered. Let me, let me ask Holly. you to email uh, 
info at ollie.org, I believe it is. Is that right, Spencer? They can get you access to the recording or AARP if you're coming in from that, that door. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I went to those websites and it was not at all obvious how to get at recordings, but um, I'll try AARP then. Thank you. Okay. And this has been fabulous. Oh, well, thank so you. I'm bummed out to be interrupted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I appreciate that.